So I founded an entire series by creationists trying to disprove evolution, and it's quite amusing to be honest, but of course there are plenty of flaws in it. I picked a random episode out of like 15 videos in the series, so let's get into it and see what they have for us, shall we? A single germline mutation can have the range of effects. No change occurs in phenotype. Some mutations don't have any noticeable effect on the phenotype of an organism. Oh yeah, one thing I forgot to tell you guys is that this little bear is actually not a creationist. He's the one who the creationist is responding to. Which is why he actually makes a lot of sense in this video. You'll see the main guy later and you'll know who he is. This can happen in many situations. Perhaps the mutation occurs in a stretch of DNA with no function. Or perhaps the mutation occurs in a protein coding region, but ends up not affecting the amino acid sequence of the protein. Small change occurs in phenotype. A single mutation caused this cat's ears to curl backwards slightly. Big change occurs in phenotype. Some really important phenotypic changes, like DDT resistance in insects are sometimes caused by single mutations. A single mutation can also have strong negative effects for the organism. Mutations that cause the death of an organism are called lethals, and it doesn't get more negative than that. Cool bear, he knows what he's talking about. So let's take a look at this creationist's response. Here's what they aren't telling you. We have never observed a beneficial mutation that added information to a genome. What? Excuse me? We have never observed a beneficial mutation that added information to a genome? I'm sorry, but that's just a flat out lie. We've seen this many times. For example, monkeys have created a new protein by a mutation combining two proteins, Trim and Cypa, to form Trim Cypa. And this new protein helps the immune system defend against retroviruses. This has even been observed to have evolved twice in two different monkey populations because it's simple and highly necessary to defend from HIV-1. A second example that is probably more relatable for you guys is the gene responsible for the production of apolipoprotein A1 Milano. This protein is classified as a high-density lipoprotein that is responsible for recycling cholesterol from the bloodstream back to the liver. I'm sure you all heard about HDLs, how good they are, and how they lower your blood cholesterol levels. Well, this is a gain-of-function mutation that has occurred in the past, literally a new protein that helps with the regulation of steroids. I'm sure those two examples are enough to prove you wrong, but let's continue the video to see what other shit you can make up. Most mutations result in disease or death. That's true, most mutations are harmful, and that's pretty logical if you think about it. Mutations are generally random in terms of the specific outcomes they produce. So when you change the function of a gene or protein randomly, the chances are they will probably be harmful. Firstly, because they usually play a specific role for the organism, which was previously selected out for by natural selection. And secondly, because the random function product has to be pretty specific to be beneficial. But nonetheless, beneficial mutations do occur. They are rare, but once they happen, they can be easily selected for by natural selection. Consider these expert opinions. One would expect that any interference with such a complicated piece of chemical machinery as the genetic constitution would result in damage. And, in fact, this is so. The great majority of mutant genes are harmful in their effects on the organism. Well, notice how he said majority. No one's arguing against that. Those which can be said to be beneficial, like antibiotic-resistant bacteria, actually result in a loss of structure and function. These are like getting locked in the basement during a tornado. You haven't gained anything, but by happy chance, you survive when others do not. They can be due to a loss of function, but they can also be due to a simple modification. Our drugs are usually targeted to inhibit a specific essential function of the target organism. Let's look at HIV for example. We have quite a few drugs to fight it, and they can target specific enzymes such as reverse transcriptase or GP120 protein. But then when we have these drugs inhibit these enzymes, it usually has some sort of interaction with said enzyme which would destroy their function, such as an allosteric inhibition. So mutation could easily occur on the one spot on the enzyme where our drug binds and make it so that said drug can no longer bind to that particular enzyme, but the mutation would still allow the enzyme to function. This is a case that is not a loss of function mutation, but simply a modification to the structure that still works. When a bacteria has a mutated gene that allows it to be resistant to a drug, it can easily pass on this gene to other bacteria so they would be resistant too. So technically, when a bacteria gains a plasmid or DNA from another bacteria, that's a gain of function. Yet what evolution needs to have happened is a mutation which adds information to the genome. Like a guy who figures out how to make his siding tornado-proof. Or a guy who figures out how to get his car to fly. But how many spelling mistakes do you have to make in the blueprints for a car before it can fly, and without passing through a phase where it explodes? And it does make a lot of mistakes. Just mutations are mostly harmful doesn't mean they can't produce a beneficial mutation that sticks. Natural selection weaves out the organisms that obtain harmful mutations while keeping the ones that have beneficial mutations. It's that simple and not as outrageous as you're claiming it to be. When people say evolution is impossible, it's not because they don't know how it could work. It's because they know enough to know it could not work. No, no, it's, uh, <laughs> it's because they don't know how it works. 
Many evolutionists stick to evolution to fill in the gaps where a step up is impossible. Impossible? What? Since evolution has been proven to without a shadow of a doubt, we can explain how certain features occurred using an explanation involving evolutionary knowledge. And when we make explanations like this, we're not saying that it most definitely happened this way. We're just saying it's a very plausible explanation. That's it. It must have evolved, they argue, because there it is. And this is a very common evolution of the gaps attitude. It'll show up again later in their writing. Evolution of the gaps, I love it. Except the difference is that we admit we're not certain and that it's the best hypothesis we have. In addition, evolution has been proven and that's enough for us to use it to fill in some gaps. Not like your god where there isn't a shred of evidence. Sorry, I assume you're a creationist because no one just flat out denies evolution unless they're like religious as fuck. There are some sorts of changes that a single mutation, or even a lot of mutations, could not cause. I don't even know where to start. Suffice it to say, duh. But now we need these guys to see just how big this list is. Alright, alright. That's true, but not in the way that you think it's true. Neither mutations nor wishful thinking will make pigs have wings. Only pop culture could have created Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Mutations could not have done it. So, turtles that can talk and walk on two legs, impossible with mutations. But bacteria that become a monkey who can talk and walk on two legs, science? No, you completely misunderstood. He said that there are things that a single mutation, or a few mutations, or a lot of mutations cannot produce, but you can get a species with drastic changes if you have an enormous amount of genetic change. That would involve a ton of mutations and a lot of natural selection. So sorry, you failed on that one. Maybe try to understand what the bear's saying before trying to refute its arguments. And that a rodent became a lizard that grew wings and learned to fly is the evolutionary story they've already admitted to, so why now is flying pigs impossible? These guys pick weird times to decide what evolution can and can't do. Or, or, hear me out, you just don't understand evolution. 